what I will be presenting is based uh, quite a lot on, on this book. Um, uh, it's a quite nice book that I highly recommend. I had it in my first talk. It's called The Theory of Intermolecular Forces by Anthony Stone. Um, he's a retired professor in, in Cambridge and is one of the you know, founders of, um, um, I would say, formal theory of, of molecular interactions or molecular forces. Um, so in most of the talks we had this, this uh, week, um, there was not much focus on you know, how you can decompose interactions between atoms or molecules into some components that you can actually understand. Right? So uh, Stefan said yesterday that I like to make sense of things. right? And uh, in fact, <clears throat> the theory of molecular interactions is exactly, you know, be developed for that reason, is to make sense of things and to understand why molecules form certain structures, you know, equilibrium or non-equilibrium. So uh, let's start from a, you know, basic example of very simple molecules. Since there are mathematicians in the audience, you know, I have to draw those molecules just... Uh, <laughs> I actually draw very badly, so um, forgive me if my hexagons are not exactly hexagonal, right? What is this? One, two, three, four, whatever, right? Yeah, this is not the hexagon, right? Sorry. Whatever. Right. whatever. Right. Four, five, six, okay, that's good. Um, you know, this is uh, the physicist version of... Uh, of a benzene molecule, right? <clears throat> so you have, you know, carbon atoms at the edges here, right? And hydrogen atoms. So this is one example of a molecule, badly drawn. And then you can have, you know, a water molecule, right? And um, so what you would like to understand is when you put those molecules together, what kind of stable arrangements they can form, right? And um, for example, the benzene molecule is a centrosymmetric molecule, right? And based on this, for example, we know that it cannot have a dipole moment, right? So if you are given the electron density of, of the system, you integrate and you calculate the dipole moment, it will be zero because of the centrosymmetric property. If you do the same for hydrogen, sorry, for, for, for water molecule, right, this is not a centrosymmetric molecule, so you will get a dipole. In fact, a water molecule has quite a significant dipole, which gives it a lot of the interesting properties in the different phases. Now, what if you wanted to understand if you now have two such benzene molecules? So, of course, they are attracted to each other, right? And uh, could you actually predict without doing any electronic structure calculation. What are the possible stable states of two benzene molecules interacting with each other, right? So that's what theory of intermolecular interactions really is about, is about predicting and about interpreting, right, based on very simple information about your molecules, such as multiple moments, um, polarizabilities, which is the change of multiple moments in an applied electric field, and also frequency-dependent polarizabilities, which is a purely quantum mechanical approach that, uh, that you need to get so-called van der Waals dispersion interactions, okay? So these are all, all the things you need to know about molecules. It's a uh, you know, set of, uh, of multiple moments, a dipole, you know, quadrupole, and so on, and a set of polarizabilities. There is a dipole polarizability, quadrupole polarizability, and so on. And in principle, and actually these are frequency dependent um, or time dependent, right? Um, and this is a response of uh, the multiple moments to an applied electric field, okay? This electric field can be time dependent and hence you get this frequency dependence here. Um, and so once you are given these quantities for a molecule, in principle you can predict when this particular molecule interacts with other molecule, what are the possible stable structures? So for benzene, since it does not have a dipole moment, only quadrupole moment is non-zero, electrostatics does not make a big contribution to the binding energy. 
And what does make a big contribution is fundamental dispersion interaction, and it typically prefers to form compact structures. So one minimum of benzene is exactly you know, staggered configuration. So you have two benzenes on top. But in reality, right, that maximizes the overlap and, and maximizes so-called fundamental dispersion interaction. But in reality, this also increases repulsion energy, Pauli repulsion, which we heard about a lot in this, in this, in this week. And so what benzene does is actually displaces. And so you have a parallel, so-called parallel displaced configuration, which is the global or local minimum, depends on the level of theory. Uh, but that's one minimum configuration. Another configuration of benzene can arise by analyzing the quadruple moment and by saying that uh, this configuration maximizes the electrostatic interaction. It's called a T-shaped configuration, right? And uh, actually, that those two configurations, parallel displaced and the um, uh, T-shaped, are the two uh, lowest energy minima, basically. And you could have guessed this by just thinking about the geometry of, of those interactions, both permanent, given by permanent moments and, and uh, polarizabilities, okay? Um, in fact, the actual minimum is not like this. The actual minimum is a bit shifted. And that's, again, because van der Waals energy prefers compact structures, right? So, um, so this is just an example to tell you how you can actually guess what will happen upon uh, when molecules interact just by you know, thinking of, in simple terms, of properties of a single molecule, right? And this is why, why theory of molecular interactions is so powerful, because you can think of properties of a single molecule and how they are affected in the presence of other molecules, which create external fields, which can be static or time dependent. Okay? Good. So now let me do this in a, in a more general way. So, um, so let us assume that we have two systems, A and B. And I represent the electron densities of those systems, you know, the sum distribution. And of course, you know, the selection density is bound because you have positive nuclei, right? So this is a stable system or a quantum mechanical system of, of um, um, nuclei and electrons. We will assume for the moment they are neutral systems, right? So the electrons and nuclei charges compensate each other, so there is no overall charge on, on, on each of the molecules. Um, and of course, you know, uh, the question we want to ask is what is the interaction energy E, right? Let's call it E int, between these two molecules, described in terms of the properties of a single molecule. Um, so, now, I call this you know, lecture theory of molecular interactions, and I'm supposing these two molecules, this, these are two molecules, but nevertheless, this can be actually an atom or atoms embedded in a solid as well. So, for example, if you use density functional theory, we can, we can make projections of electron densities of the whole system on fragments, and we can still define interactions between those fragments. Now, this will miss certain effects and so on, but in many different solids, even, even hard solids, we can still use this interaction picture. So this is a very general thing, right? It does not only apply to molecules in vacuum space, but also applies to many of the solids, at least non-metallic solids. By the way, for that reason, density functional theory is often not interpreted in terms of, in terms of intermolecular interactions because it's based on a metallic state. For that reason, many people do not use this theory to explain DFT result, okay? Okay, so, so A and B can be anything. They can be atoms, molecules, or atoms in molecules, right? And of course, you know, what we can, what we assume that we can do is we can solve the Schrodinger equation, right? So we have a Hamiltonian for system A, we have a Hamiltonian for system B, and we can solve the Schrodinger equation for both of them independently. So that means that we will get a set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So you have, you know, energy, um, the ground state energy, I will call it E0. You will have, you know, excited state energy here and the same over here, B, right, 2B. 
so on and so forth. Okay, and you have um, eigenvectors, right? The wave functions of the system, one A, so on, zero B, one B, and so on. Okay. Um, now, of course, right, if we have two, now these two molecules, um, in principle, the, the total wave function, let's call this EAB, is a um, state I, is a certain anti-symmetrized product of the isolated wave function. Now, this anti-symmetrization operator is a very complicated operator, and I will not really touch much on this, um, but this is actually discussed quite in detail in, in, in the textbook I showed. And this was actually mentioned also when we discussed, you know, in the first talks between Kieran and me, the symmetry adapted perturbation theory is exactly the theory that defines this anti-symmetrization operator for two interacting systems. Why are the subscripts are the same? Could they be different? Or? Here? Yeah. They are the same because you're expanding any given state, right, in terms of the states, excited states or ground states of, yeah. Now, of course, yeah, I mean, in general, right, the interaction between molecules effectively can be represented as an effective occupation of excited states, right? So, in principle, this the dependence can be more complicated than just the dependence on the same state, right? But this, you know, I, I represented by anti-symmetrization operator, uh, but in principle, it's true that you can actually depend on all the states, right? So maybe, yeah, we can, in principle, we can drop this, right? And say that, yeah, in principle, you can depend on the, on the excited states as well, right? On all the other states. Of the system. So I will not be concerned here with this. This is a very, you know, this is a completely different lecture, right? How you actually treat anti-symmetrization effects. But what is also known, empirically at least, is that anti-symmetrization effects decay exponentially with distance. Right? This is Pauli repulsion. Pauli repulsion decays exponentially with distance, at least for finite systems. This might not be the case for large systems. You have two surfaces, you know, you can get effects which which do not decay exponentially, they decay algebraically, but in most finite systems, this is exponentially decaying operator. And for that reason, we will assume now that we work in a long range approximation, and so we can expand the states of the total system in terms of the product states of the isolated system. Even that, although it sounds very simple, leads to a lot of interest in physics, as I will demonstrate uh, in the rest of my lecture. Okay, so, so basically, you know, the anti-symmetrization represents Pauli repulsion, right? And Pauli repulsion decays exponentially. Again, this is actually an interesting question for mathematicians, right? Under which conditions this is, this does not hold. This is not really known, I think, uh, uh, formally. Um, so what is the decay if you have two surfaces? What is the decay of the, of the exchange energy, right? Um, that could be interesting algebraic effects. Okay, so, um, so now, uh, in this case, we can formulate a perturbation Hamiltonian. Right? Sorry, let me first write the full Hamiltonian of the, of the coupled system, right? So it's uh, Hamiltonian of A plus Hamiltonian of B plus interaction Hamiltonian, right? Let me just call this H uh, prime. And H prime is nothing else but Coulomb interaction. A, B, R, A, B. Sorry, A, B, of course, smaller letters, right? Okay, 
So the perturbation Hamiltonian is just the Coulomb interaction between all the charged particles of, of my system, right? Both nuclei and electrons. Um, so, of course, now if um, the perturbation Hamiltonian is small, which it is if these two molecules are separated by a certain distance, then we can use perturbation theory uh, to express all molecular interactions. So let's use Riley Schrodinger perturbation theory. And we will go to second order in this case. So, you know, of course, you have zeros order, right? Where your energy, right? Let's call it zero. It's just nothing else but energy of uh, A plus energy of B, right? I guess, let me. Okay. So the Z, A, Z, B, that's the particles of the like the subscript, like the lowercase a. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And th that includes the yeah. left electron, left electron nuclei, nuclei. Yes, uh, that's right. That includes electron, electron, electron nuclei. And uh, in most cases, what we will do is we will take a, a multiple expansion of that so that you just take the operators uh, that involve both nuclear and electrons and dipole operator, quadrupole, and so on and so forth. But, yeah. Um, okay, so, so yeah, so this is trivial. Okay, at first order, this is now interaction energy. If you want, I can write interaction. Um, It's again, you know, a trivial thing, right? Okay. And so, you know, this is just trivial electrostatics, right? You can rewrite this, right? Because this is nothing else but the density, right? Um, well, you can basically. This is the density of A, this is the density of B, right? So you can rewrite this as a M of A, R, right? Let's say R1, M of B, R2, right? R1 minus R2, right? DR1, DR2, okay? And this is just, you know, simple classical electrostatic. Um, the exchange will be there if you introduce the... No, no, no. This is the density of A in the absence of molecule B and the density of B in the absence of molecule A. If you introduce anti-symmetrization, of course, you will get, you know, more terms that describe how the... In first order approximation, the, the exchange energy modification to this depends on overlaps of electron density. But why don't you introduce the metrization? Why is it? Because if, even if you just look at without interaction, the ground state has to be anti-symmetrized. So the ground state of this system is anti-symmetrized. The ground state of that system is anti-symmetrized. But the combined system is not. <coughs> Can I think of this compensation by the, the kinetic energy of course of analyzing the two? So the, the changing kinetic energy. Well, this is a contribution to it, right? But so, of course, if you use a virial theorem, I guess you could just rewrite things through the kinetic energy, yeah. right? Um, so, so yeah, so so of course, yeah, so so. The main repulsive effect is exactly what you say is the kinetic energy, right? It's the fact that the kinetic energy, when you have overlapping densities, it, it rises, right? Because you don't have so much space to, to, for the electron dynamics, right? And so, so your energy rises. So, so in a, yeah, that's the main effect uh, um, 
that, that you should include if you anti-symmetrize the wave function. And, um, and so this, there are also models for simple models for exchange that are based on, on overlaps between two densities. Okay. But again, we work in the long range approximation, so for now, this is just a trivial electrostatic interaction between the two, the two systems. And we've saw this, this is also, you know, in electronic structure calculations, this would be a Hartree term. And that's what people call the Hartree term. Okay, things get much more interesting when you go to second order perturbation theory. So it's a long expression, but let me write it. Fully, okay. Okay. Okay, then you have a complementary term, psi i, a, psi j, e. So I have to divide by an energy determined by the energy denominator here, right? A minus alpha J E minus E zero A zero B. Okay? So um, at the second order of perturbation theory, you now have a sum of excited states, right, of both systems. So you have, an you have a matrix element, right? So you have an excitation here in the, in the denominator. These are the excited state energies minus the ground state energies. By this definition, that's why you get a minus sign here because in principle it should be inverted here because that's how excitation process happens. And here you have the corresponding matrix elements for this excitation. Okay. So your system is in a ground state, right? You excite and then you de-excite, okay? So, so in your perturbation theory, there's a small parameter. Is there a physical meaning to this parameter? Yeah, the physical meaning is basically that this interaction is small compared to the intra-molecular interactions, right? And so, yes, you could the development, in principle, just can be done in a lambda parameter, right, that multiplies Coulomb potential. Uh, so what did the, you see sign J run over? Over the states, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Now, if you look at this term, uh, it's not very interpretable. And to interpret it better, what we need to do is to split this, this sum into ground state and excited state effects. And when we do that, we will find interpretation of, of the different terms that we have at second order of perturbation theory, which will be so-called induction energy and, and dispersion energy. Okay. So um, to do this, we separate into three parts. The 
The first one we call E induction on molecule A that comes from molecule B. So we take all the terms that are not zero, right? They don't have the zeros, uh, the ground state. Zero. Okay, so we take out the term which corresponds to the ground state of one system here and, and one system is allowed to be excited on. And so basically what this means physically is that system A is polarizing, so it's exciting, in the presence of system B which provokes an electric field. Okay. Now, equivalently, right, you can formulate a second term, which is the same thing, you just do the same, you invert the, the indices from system A to system B, okay? So this is called induction energy of molecule A due to the presence of molecule B. This is called the induction energy of molecule B due to the presence of molecule A. Um, so the, if you look at the term here, right, if you combine this times this, right, this is the density, right, um, this is the density, right, of molecule B, and molecule A is being excited. So the interpretation of this is that you have permanent electrostatic moments, right, like this ones, on molecule A, right, sorry, on molecule B, and molecule A polarizes in the presence of those. So it's an interaction between a permanent electrostatic moment and an indu induced electrostatic moment, okay? And the induced, uh, the, the induction is described by this polarizability, okay? So perhaps now let me just um, explain this in a bit pictorial way. So, so if, you have a, if you have a molecule, let's assume you know that you have something like this, it might have a dipole moment, right? And the dipole moment is a vector, right? And you might have another molecule here, and it also might have, you know, depending on the orientation, right? It might have a dipole moment pointing this way, right? Now, a dipole, right, you would have plus, minus, basically, right? And so, for example, this configuration is repulsive, right? Because you have two minuses close, right? So this will be a repulsive dipole-dipole interaction. If you have the other way around, right? And, and, you, and this, this one has the same orientation, then this would be, for example, attractive dipole-dipole interaction, okay? So depending on the geometry of the two dipoles, you get different either attraction or repulsion. And this is, this is what this term would, would give you, right? So it can be both attractive and repulsive, depending on the orientations of the molecules which orient the dipole moments. The polarizability that now enters here is, the easiest way to understand it is that you have Say for a moment it's a sphere of electron density, okay? So you have a positive charge here, which has an infinite mass, and then you have a negative 
compensating charge so that again there is no um, there is no charge there is no this system is neutral and then what you do is you put this system in an electric field right? and what happens is this density right, will slightly displace right and the center right would basically displace the other way around and you get a dipole moment okay and the the dipole moment that you get here the strength depends on the um, basically on the volume of this of this system so this is, uh, you know, what polarizability is. So polarizability is a relation right, between an electric field and a dipole that is generated in that electric field. So it's a tensor, right, because these two quantities are vectors. Okay. This is just a, a parenthesis to explain in a very simple way um, how to, you know, practically use those formulas and put numbers to them, okay? So the, you can calculate these quantities from this matrix elements actually, right? But classically they can also be described, or explained pretty easy, okay? Any questions? What's the third term? <laughs> That's where I was going to, right? <laughs> That's the most interesting one. What happens to the term where both are in the ground state? Which one? The I and J are equivalent. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's the third one. But that's the third one. Yeah, yeah. We that's don't have it now. Yeah. So, so we don't have the, the real, the quantum term. <laughs> so, so of course, these are all quantum terms, right? They come from the you know, wave functions of the systems. But classical methods for classical force fields, they are able to describe electrostatics and they are able to describe polarization. So these are called classical electrostatic-like terms, basically. So for example, in the previous talk, right, we had uh, these polarizable force fields and what they do is, you know, obtain this induction effect, basically. And the zero, zero term of that is something like second order. The condition yeah, is I plus J not equals zero, right? Yeah. yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is, so I, I wrote two terms, right? There is one missing still. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the third term, which I will mark with an asterisk because this is the term I most like. This one is called dispersion. So, so this term is a non-classical term and it implies excitations, right, of both systems from the ground state to the excited state. Um, to understand the conceptual physics behind, with what, what kind of quantities are involved, you need to generalize this picture. So this is a static picture, right? You have a static electric field here. Now you need to put a, um, 
uh, frequency dependent electric field, right? There's an exponential, you know, E minus I. Okay. Um, so I will, I will, so, so the kind of the conceptual picture to understand this term is much better explained with a model system. And at the end, I will do a model system of two oscillators that interact. And from there, you can see much better the conceptual underpinning of, of the dispersion energy. Um, uh, because this concept also, the frequency dependent polarizability is easy to understand for real frequencies. So you hit your system with a laser, right? And you have poles, right? And so it, it's a function that has poles. And typically, you do a, 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 a transformation to the imaginary plane. And at that, uh, in the imaginary plane, it's just a simple decaying function of frequency. Now, the, the issue with this term here, why it's so hard to understand, let's say, is that the properties of system A and system B are coupled here. So you cannot easily deconvolve this denominator, right? Um, and so in a way, in all those terms, we could decompose into property of system A and property of system B, right? So we had electrostatic energy that just involves the isolated densities. We have the induction energy that involves the density, the ground state density, and the polar polarizability of another system, right? So we always used just properties of one system at a time. But if you look at this term, then in principle, the two systems are coupled here. So it's a global interaction energy, right? But we can do a simple mathematical trick to actually decompose this term also in properties of system A and system B, so the frequency-dependent polarizabilities. And so what we do this is, uh, what we can easily do is to use this integral identity. So if you have, um, you know, this term, 1 over V plus W, let me W this way. So you can decompose it as an integral, W, V square plus some U, V square plus W square D. Sorry, this is omega, so omega squared, just, okay. And so we introduce an integration parameter, omega, which is nothing else but actually the, the frequency, right? um, which we will see later. And by using this, uh, this relation, we can decompose the above, uh, the above sum into properties of system A and system B. This, of course, have to be positive, right? And this is obtained by, by contour integration. So applying this to the formula above, then, um, yeah, let me first define um, and then I P. Then I just to, to simplify notation, and I get minus two p. Um, sorry, minus two h bar p. Okay, p alpha beta t. So I will explain this now.
So I will work now in the dipole approximation. Okay, then we multiply by. Sorry that this expression is too large, but that's the last, the last lone expression. <laughs> Okay, that's the final result. Um, and so what I did here is, so this originally was written with the perturbing Hamiltonian, which is all Coulomb interaction. Maybe you could move it a bit to the left, I can't see in the okay. corner. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so this perturbing Hamiltonian was the Coulomb potential of the nuclei and electrons of both systems, and I take the dipole approximation here, okay? And you can, you know, develop this further. And so these are dipole tensors, dipole interaction tensors, that these are the Cartesian components of those tensors, okay? Um, and there are two of them, right, for each, for each system, for molecule A and B. And then this allows me to just uh, use the dipole operator uh, from the ground state or the excited state of each system, and this is nothing else, you know, normalized by the frequency here as a frequency dependent polarizability. Okay? And this comes out because I define this contour integration here. So you can say a frequency just comes out out of nowhere. I didn't really put any, any uh, time dependent field, but because the quantum mechanics tells me that the densities fluctuate, right, there's always time dependence, implicit time dependence in, in quantum mechanics. Okay. Yep. Um, so what, what are these tensors exactly? This these are dipole, dipole interaction tensors, so the... So it's a cross product between... So these are the Cartesian components, right, of one. Over R alpha R. Let's say, let me call this R A R B, I guess. Okay. So this is just a you know, dipole approximation to the Coulomb potential. Where? This is a product. Yeah, so it looks like you have a sum of a bunch of terms before you had some of a bunch of terms, like you didn't have two sums. Yeah, so so that's right. So so this here, now this is, this, is, this is fine, right? So this, this here, so I separated, right? I had here products of two. I have here just the properties of one. Right? Yeah. Is your um, last dipole operator that's delta of B, right? The beta? 
Okay. Yeah. Delta, right? Delta. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's B, right? That's a superscript. Just B. And denominator. Yes, that's right, B. Yes. Oh, yeah, denominator as well. The, the frequency of, of B, right? Sure, yes. That's correct. B. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you just explain again what the mu's are? What the Ah, mu. Mu is a is a dipole operator. It's charge times displacement. Mm -hmm. So this is just again, this is just taking the first term of the Taylor expansion of this of this operator here. So I don't any longer have nuclei and electrons, but I just have the response of the of the electrons with respect to the nuclei, basically. And I take the first term in this in this expansion. Okay, good. Um, okay, very good. So um, to simplify this further, we can uh, use this concept of frequency dependent polarizability. Let me. This. And we write this horrible formula in a quite an efficient way. So minus, yeah, actually. This goes here. Um, no, no, that's fine. It goes there. But then it changes because of the definition of the of the dipole polarizability. Sorry, it's good. Um, yeah. B. Again, I have the dipole tensors. Um, for this data. Um, Um, alpha gamma, gamma, A, I, omega, beta, I, omega. Okay. So um, this 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 horrible matrix elements there and the, the denominator. Can be just reformulated as this frequency dependent polarizabilities. It's nothing else but the change of the dipole moment to a fluctuating electric field. Okay. And these functions are very simple functions. If you actually plot them as a function of omega, right, they look something like this. So you have here the static polarizability of your system, and then it decays because, of course, the, the higher the imaginary frequency of the field, the less the system is able to respond to it, right? Because it's, the field is too fluctuating too fast. Although it's this imaginary frequency is, is a bit, you know, hard to imagine, I think. Um, as is imaginary time. Um, but nevertheless, you get this nice and smooth functions, right? And so you can actually approximate these functions easily, right? So computing them is actually very, very hard. So the um, um, the leading methods today are so-called linear response couple cluster methods because uh, you need a response of the system, right? And uh, even for an atom, it probably takes a few weeks to compute this, this function. Um, but since it looks so simple, right, uh, you can just compute the static part, right, alpha zero, and then approximate the frequency dependence because there are some rules on how this function behaves for high frequencies. So basically, from the number of particles that polarize, you can, you can easily do this. I just, what about the Cartesian coordinates? Right. Okay, so on the left, you have a scalar. 
Yeah, it's a treasure room. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, so you should put a trace here. All right. What happened to your prefactor? Yeah, that's because of the definition of, of the, there is a factor of two in, in the definition of plausibility. That's why two goes now to, um, to the denominator. Yeah, the plausibility is defined with a factor of two always. In, yeah. um, okay, so now if you have a spherical system, like an atom, or Right, or two molecules far away, then this can be written as a function of the distance between between two systems as zero r to the six, right? um, some zero square, right? Okay. There's a form of pi, some zero square from the dipole operators, and we get a pi. And you get R6, and then you have this integral, which is now just the product of the isotropic polarizability. Omega, omega, the omega, okay? So this is the term that you see <clears throat> in most textbooks. Right? When you trace this, you get, uh, from the trace you get six r to the minus six, because each one scales as, as r to the minus three, right? so this is r to the minus six. And uh, you get four pi epsilon zero in each one of this, because it's a derivative, second derivative of Coulomb potential. Right? Uh, and then you just have a product of isotropic frequency dependent plausibility. That's just for the dispersion term, right? Not yeah. The full. Yeah, yeah. Dispersion, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the what you find in most textbooks. This is the simplest possible way of writing dispersion energy for two coupled isotropic systems. Okay, so uh, let me just summarize this. Um, so you have once again, right, we said you have some system, you know, A, which can have an inosotropic uh, um, density, and um, the, in general, you could have a dipole moment, right, or any other multiple moment, and so if uh, there is an induction, right, from one, one system, then effectively you can either increase or decrease the, the dipole moment. So this was the permanent dipole moment, but because of the presence of system B, this dipole moment changes, and now it can be, you know, there is an additional induced effect on the dipole moment of each system, and this is the induction energy. But in addition, right, the, these two molecules fluctuate, right, and because of that, you have the, you know, dispersion energy. Okay, this is very pictorial representation. And so the electrostatics again involve, involve permanent, permanent interaction. So permanent, permanent multiple moments. Induction involves permanent induced dipole moments and dispersion involves induced fluctuating, induced fluctuating. Okay. Because there is a frequency dependence. Uh, roughly in an order of magnitude, like how much does each contribute? Yeah, that highly depends on the system. So for benzene dimer, the um, dispersion energy is, is actually at the equilibrium is much larger than the binding energy. 
because it is compensated by Pauli repulsion, which I haven't really talked about a lot. But typically for um, systems which are van der Waals bound, which means that they are non-polar, so they don't have dipole moments, the van der Waals energy is often twice larger than the binding energy. So it, it is a very big effect. Uh, in water, for example, the main effect is electrostatics and induction. This creates hydrogen bonding, right? So a lot of hydrogen bonding is electrostatic induction, and about 20% of it is dispersion. This is done, uh, these numbers come from the symmetry adapted perturbation theory analysis of the different terms, which in the end is actually quantitative theory, right? This theory is not quantitative, it's qualitative, right? Uh, could you explain what you mean by spherical system? So what, what exactly is a uh, spherical? Spherical when you have no multiple moments, when you no integrate, when you... moments. Yeah. And the system is potentially symmetric. Right. Or when you, when you are far away, right, you can trace over these components and still yeah. the isotropic average gives you a good, a good uh, okay. quantitative representation. Yeah, I want to add this more like as a comment to the audience because uh, yesterday people asked like what kind of working group ideas are there. I think working on research problems are great, but meanwhile there will be a, like a few things that if I say from the lecture something are not so clear, just writing down a whole detail of notes would be very nice. For example, Alex's uh, explanation of this. Uh, Permanent dipole, use dipole, maybe crystal clear physics. Well, but for the math people, I would say that, uh, I don't know, maybe it's not so obvious. I think this is uh, actually a great application of density functional perturbation theory uh, or a simplified version of it because uh, so far, assuming everything is like, uh, uh, assuming like, uh, uh, there's no self-consistency going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's right, okay. that's yeah. right. So, so, so just uh, being able to write down the formulation of uh, permanent, uh, <coughs> permanent dipole, induced dipole, using yeah. the language, I mean, how does the chi not appear? It hasn't appeared yet explicitly, although obviously it is there. So, uh, formulas working group, writing that down, <laughs> that, that thing, as I said, easily expand into three pages. And uh, I think that would be a very concrete thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I think, as we said the first day, uh, Dima, I think, said that there are no stupid questions, right? And, and I know that this, this, you know, this, this jargon, well, it's not the jargon, I would say, this con concept that we easily throw around, uh, you know, in physics, they often um, have to be put in a mathematical perspective, maybe, or discussed in, in, in a, from different perspectives to, in order to understand what, what, what is going on. Yeah, but for example, just to, for that permanent dipole thing, for example, with Alex proved two pictures, what are you mold? Right? So you need to separate the it's an integral part, over the density. Yeah. You have the electron part, you need to figure out which parts are orthogonal so that they are cancelled. And then you need to sum over the sum over those i's, right? And you have two parts, you need to figure out I mean those are metabody not A and psi i they're metabody like the functions. And you need to take the marginal, get the density, and then you also take the uh, figure out what the polarizability is, get rid of the sum i is not equal to zero, and finally you see the compact formulation, which is something of the form of dipole kinot dipole. So no dipole potential yeah. kinot dipole potential, That's right. which is the induced dipole with permanent dipole. So, so I think working through all those things, L like a clearly. Yeah, yeah, and there are a few people from my group that actually work on on advanced, uh, you know, theory of molecular forces that can also. Yeah, and uh, getting help from them, I think, would be fantastic. Yeah. This is one like concrete. It's not take a lot of research topic, but uh, yeah. understanding those. I think. But but then there are there are actual research questions, right, which are still yeah, open. Yeah, and actually, research questions you said may not be that far away. Yeah, right. Um, okay. Yes. Um, so, to generalize this a bit, right? So what? So this is a very simple system, right? I mean, I said I have two two molecules or atoms, right? They have this permanent induced and fluctuating moments, 
And, and I can now understand in second order perturbation theory what's going on. But of course, you know, that's not the end of the story because we want to do realistic systems or many body systems, right? And uh, um, we want to go beyond. So the question is, is second order perturbation theory sufficient? Right? What about third order perturbation theory and, and fourth order and so on and so forth? And uh, in most cases, second order perturbation theory is insufficient. So it's, it's, it's a good approximation for two atoms which are separated by a large, or two molecules that are separated by a large distance. But if you have a many body system, actually, second order perturbation theory is insufficient. Right? And of course, we've worked on this for 10 years now. So, um, and uh, just to tell you sort of uh, conceptually what. Alex, before you raise, well, you just raised it, but the, that sum was over. Did it include the divergent terms that i equals j equals zero? No. Or no. only? Okay. No. So, so just to fund the, you know, say generalization. I will now not go into any, you know, uh, math, um, but if you have, so first, higher order perturbation theory couples right, all terms. Right? So if you go to third order, we will now start getting coupling between electrostatics, polarization, dispersion, right? And uh, that, of course, muddies the water a bit. So uh, the interpretation becomes uh, complicated. And uh, so, for example, you know, in my group, we worked for a very long time on this many body dispersion Hamiltonian that was mentioned several times. And in that Hamiltonian, we solve it to infinite order. And, and that means we couple polarization to dispersion to actually to infinite order. And those terms are very small if you have two atoms separated by a large distance. But when you have a many body system which is uh, chemically bound, the overlaps between those atoms actually create very strong polarization dispersion couplings. And uh, you really need to treat them non perturbatively uh, or, or, or perturbatively to infinite order, right? It depends what your definition of non perturbative is. Um, perturbatively to infinite order, and you have to resum, right? Because this, the perturbation theory actually fluctuates. And so if you stop at some order, actually next order might screw up your result um, in, in, in a major way. So, so for that reason, um, one has to be careful uh, with this higher order term sometimes. Um, and second, of course, in many body systems, there is a range of effects. So the typical example is you have three isotropic atoms. So they are spherical, right? And you want to know what is the interaction energy between A, B, C, right? So of course, there are interactions between A and B, you know, B and C, A and C. But there is an additional many body effect that is a non-additive effect, right? And uh, in the case of dispersion energy, for example, this is called uh, Axelrod Tela, you've all heard of Tela at least, right? Muto term. This is a Japanese physicist, right? This is an American physicist. And uh, they published two papers which were all published in the same year, I think. This was, I think, 49, if I don't remember correctly. And this is a very short paper in JCP. I think it's half a page or so. And uh, has, I don't know, 10,000 citations by now. Because it's really the first demonstration of a many body quantum mechanical interaction. Uh, uh, it's, it's a great paper. Just third order perturbation theory applied to the system. And uh, you get a non-additive effect where you now need to take the angles of this triangle into account, right? And you get a term which scales with the pairwise distances plus angular term. And if you now extend this to fourth order and so on, you will get you know, quite complicated looking expressions. Right? You can still write them and you can still understand them. And if you go to real many body system, then the particle picture breaks down and you need to think of collective plasmonic modes that uh, uh, um, where polarization couples to dispersion. This is what is still current research, I would say, in the field.
Okay. Well, I still have seven, ten minutes, no? Because I think it's until 12.15, no? Last question. <laughs> okay, let me just very quickly give you a conceptual picture of of the dispersion interactions where you can really see exactly where this, this polarization arises without the need to, to actually define it uh, uh, through, through wave, so this complex wave functions, right, or through this uh, complicated looking expressions. Um, let me just do it here, I don't need much space, I think. Um, so, model for undivided dispersion. So let me also explain a bit. So, so I said that this is a dispersion energy, right? But actually it's also called often in the physics community van der Waals interactions. Now in chemistry community, van der Waals interactions refer to the uh, interplay between Pauli repulsion and dispersion attraction. Uh, in the physics community, people often say just van der Waals as, as a synonym of, of, of equivalent of dispersion, but I prefer then to call it van der Waals dispersion because then it's all clear to chemists and physicists what they're talking about. So it's the attractive part of the van der Waals energy. Um, and van der Waals, of course, was uh, you know, the person who really explained intermolecular interactions, so why you uh, real systems deviate from ideal gas behavior, which has no interactions. For that reason, all intermolecular interactions, so many of them are called van der Waals interactions. But that's another lecture, bro. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, okay, so now let us do a very simple model. Once again, we have two atoms, right? But we will represent these atoms by a model which we call a Drude oscillator, which is nothing else but a quantum harmonic oscillator with charges. So in quantum harmonic oscillator, it doesn't have charges typically, right? It's a, it's a mass which oscillates with some frequency with respect to uh, some position, right? Some center of mass. But in this case, we also have charges on the nucleus and on this Drudon particle. Okay, so, um, so we have a nucleus with an infinite mass, right? And we have a, a Drudon particle, right? Which has mass and charge a negative charge because it mimics electrons. And then here the nucleus has, you know, let's say an infinite mass and a positive charge, and it's bound harmonically with some frequency omega. So these charges are, you know, they compensate, so you have a neutral, overall neutral system, right? And uh, the charges are needed, right, because we will put this harmonic oscillator in a field of another harmonic oscillator, okay? And so this happens for, once again, right, we have this oscillator as well, right? Um, we'll assume for simplicity that it has the same oscillation frequency. And of course now the question is, you know, is it a good model for real systems? And it is, right? This can only be proven empirically, of course, by comparing to some higher, higher level calculations. But that's what we've been doing, you know, as I said, for the past 10 years. So we know how to parameterize these things. You have three parameters, m, omega, and q. And you can use these three parameters to represent any three properties of a real atom. For example, the dipole polarizability the, uh, uh, and the dispersion coefficients, which are integrals of this frequency-dependent polarizability. Okay, so this system is isotropic, which means it has no electrostatic, so if I evaluate the integral of uh, the first moment of the density, which gives me zero, right, and because there's no permanent moment as well, there's no induction energy, right, for induction you need at least one permanent, permanent moment, and so the only energy that exists here is dispersion energy. Um, so then, right, let me um, write the Hamiltonian for the system, right, So you have the kinetic energy, you have the quadratic potential energy in terms of the displacement x. This is one dimensional system for now. I can generalize it to any dimensions because in harmonic oscillators dimensions separate, right? So you can have any dimensionality of your harmonic oscillator. Um, okay. Then I have the same thing for, for B. And plus 
So again, I have the same parameters here, right? Uh, so both oscillators are, are equivalent. And um, then the full Hamiltonian is like this. B square square. Also enough. Okay. XA um, square plus XB square plus C square XB. So, so I have the separate Hamiltonians, right? Plus I add an interaction term. That's just a quadratic quadratic term and with some coupling constants in it. This coupling constant can depend on the distance between the two atoms. Okay? Um, in general, if it's a dipole potential, it's just one over r cube, right? It's one dimensional systems. So. Um, with some, you know, prefactors of charge and four pi epsilon zero. Um, now, this is a quadratic Hamiltonian, right? So it can be separated in normal modes, right? So, so we just define normal modes. say plus minus xb, right? And uh, then the Hamiltonian separates into, again, two non-interacting oscillators, plus c um, x plus xb squared plus one over four m pi minus p b square plus four k one minus c say minus x b squared. Okay, so this is this Hamiltonian now by just this normal mode transformation. Nothing else but two new separated uh, um, um, oscillators that don't interact, right? And so, but these oscillators do not have the same frequency now, right? But they have a different frequency, okay? So now the only thing I have to do is to obtain the frequencies of those oscillators and then compute the zero point energy of the uncoupled system, which is trivial. It's one half h bar omega e, right, squared. Um, I'm sorry, no, not squared, omega e. And then I have to define the coupled frequencies of uh, these oscillators. Okay, so, so the zero point energy, right, of the whole system is one half h bar, right, omega plus, mm, plus omega minus, right, and this is one half h bar omega, um, let me call this theta omega zero, zero, omega zero, right, and one square root one plus c plus um, square root one minus c, okay, and I can now decompose and this in uh, in a Taylor expansion, right? And I get two minus one fourth c square minus five over sixty four c fourth, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, this is the zero point energy of the of this Hamiltonian. Right? Um, so that's the lowest energy level, right? And uh, here you see immediately this term corresponds to the energy of the isolated oscillators, right? So it vanishes when we take the, the interaction energy, right? So let's say B and maybe dispersion, just although that's the whole energy, right? there's no, no, nothing else but dispersion. And uh, then this is uh, minus zero, right? Um, one half c square, one over eight square, um, plus five over 178 c 
C4s, and so on, and so on and so forth, okay? Um, so now for two dipoles, C is proportional to one over R cube. And so then you immediately see that this term is R to the minus six, this term is R to the minus 12, and this goes to infinity. And, and this is uh, pretty interesting because, um, so, so what we had in the second order perturbation theory, right, is only this term. So this means this is a fourth order perturbation theory, right, then there will be six order perturbation theory, and so on and so forth. So only the even perturbative terms uh, um, are non-vanishing. And the physics behind this is so-called screening physics. This word was mentioned uh, many times during this week. So this means that you have atom A, right, inducing a dipole on atom B. Atom B induces a dipole on atom A, and this is an infinite order process, right? So in first order perturbation theory, the isolated fluctuating dipoles interact of A and B. This is the R to the minus six term, second order perturbation theory. Then this guy, this fluctuating dipole induces a fluctuating dipole, so it changes the fluctuating dipole of, 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 of uh, atom B, and this goes forever, okay? And so you always have to close the field lines, and that's why only even uh, orders of perturbation theory contribute. Um, and so this is nice, right? This also tells you something interesting, that, that if you do the full quantum mechanical solution, right, there are terms much beyond the second order perturbation theory, which might be important. For two atoms, this of course scales as r to the minus 12, so it's much smaller than, than this r to the minus six. But if you have a many body system, then those terms can actually become dominant because the numerator also has the geometry in it, right, in general. So not only the denominator will scale with higher and higher power of the distance, but the numerator will also have the geometrical information. And so you might have very um, complex renormalization effects that in the end contribute to the energy of a many body system quite significantly. Okay, so that's the basic physics I wanna, I wanna say. Um, and uh, just to connect also to some other talks that we had, so all this theory I've described is based on simplest quantum mechanics. So I assume that the classical Coulomb potential is what makes charges interact. But of course, in reality, we know that there are, uh, the field really is, quantum field is, is what propagates the interaction. And so, for example, if you work in a, a longer distance regime between two atoms, then the speed of light will matter, right? Uh, because the interaction is propagated with a frequency dependent Green's function of the electromagnetic field. And that will change the, you know, from, so this is called in physics retardation. And this will change from R to the minus six potential to R to the minus seven potential, which involves the speed of light, of course. And you can derive all this with a very simple model or with a full QED model. So in full QED, for example, you will not only have terms that depend on, on matter excitations, but also on the field excitation. And you need to go to fourth order perturbation theory because both the matter and the field are excited at the same time. Okay. Good, so I think this is probably enough already for, for this uh, um, introduction to intermolecular interactions. And but I already tried to sort of uh, hint on, on, on what are the current research lines. So for example, QED is, is a very hot topic at the moment, how uh, uh, the quantum treatment of vacuum actually changes this theory and, and whether you have new terms that appear. And in fact, there are new terms that appear when you go to QED uh, and you do a more fundamental treatment of molecular interactions. Also the treatment of many body systems, very large systems, there is a lot of physics which is unknown and there's a lot of interesting effects and so, all of these things are, go beyond my basic lecture, uh, kindergarten version of <laughs> molecular interactions, right? Um, Stone's book was written, I think, in 97, if I remember correctly. So by now it's a kindergarten you know, knowledge. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I think as Lean said, fortunately has to leave to 
catch his fly. Um, yeah, this is yeah, this is one particular area which which would be nice to use as a connection between between different fields. Um, maybe just the last comment. So why this picture is not used in electronic structure calculations typically is because uh, in density functional theory, once again, everything is based on a homogeneous electron gas. And in a homogeneous electron gas, basically the, um, the definition of, of energy is local. But it doesn't mean that there are no non-local effects, right? It just means that the system is homogeneous and described by a single parameter, which is electron density, at, which is the same at each point. And so uh, for an interaction picture, you need a non-local, right? You need interaction at least between two objects. And so, for example, if you take homogeneous electron gas, you could then take spheres of homogeneous electron gas, and you can define a, um, an interaction between these two spheres, right? These two spheres are neutral, so again, they're an isotropic, so there is no electrostatics, there is no induction, but there is dispersion. And, and so this picture, right, of interactions, even in principle, helps to understand the homogeneous electron gas. Um, and in quantum chemistry, this picture is often not used because the basis sets that you use to expand your wave function changes from A to B to a complex AB, right? And so it's pretty hard to actually define an interaction because your basis set changes so dramatically. But there are people who work on this, and, 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 and uh, so interpretability of interactions has become quite a hot field in, in quantum chemistry as well. And people are working on how you can extract those interactions, for example, from couple cluster wave functions. Okay, very good, so thank you very much. <laughs>